I think we have a very, well, I'll say a very interesting thing to present to you, very shocking thing, really. We're going to play next Sunday night a about 10 or 12 minute tape, and I think Abraham Roberts, who made the bomb that went off in this church about six years ago, and who made another one that was in this church for six years, found just a week ago Saturday, uh, Abraham Roberts made a tape which he outlined his plans and his motivation, what caused him to attempt to blow this church up. And I think if you could see all the things that have been found, including the two bombs and other things, makings of other bombs that have been found, I think you would feel that he'd plan to blow this church to the ground, all these buildings, at one time. But thank God the Lord undertook, and that didn't happen. But uh, Abraham Roberts made a tape. We did not know that until a week ago, when these buildings were being searched and every nook and corner was being looked into uh, for safety. We found a tape that Abraham Roberts made before he was blown into eternity by one of the bombs that he made. Now, next Sunday night, we're going to play that tape. Not to be mean, not to retaliate. We don't feel that way at all. Our hearts are broken that a young man must go out to meet God with that on his hands and on his heart and his soul. But I think you ought to hear it. You, you'll hear one pray to evil spirits. And uh, you'll hear the plans to do all he could to stop the gospel and the word of God. We're going to play that tape here next Sunday night, and we want God to use it somehow. We don't know how, but we want the Lord to use it for his glory. Also, I want to mention to you again that on the last Sunday of the month, uh, the last Sunday of this month of May, which of course is the close of the Midwestern Baptist College school year, we'll be having commencement that Sunday night at 7 o'clock. But we're planning, uh, God willing, we're asking the Lord to give us a great weekend. Dr. Curtis Hudson is going to be here. He'll be speaking at the alumni banquet at the college gymnasium on Saturday night, starting at 6.30. He'll also be speaking here on Sunday morning. Now, what we want to do is to make this Sunday morning service really a great and tremendous evangelistic service. Uh, you know, it's been my privilege in my lifetime to hear uh, the greatest preachers, greatest evangelists, and greatest preachers of this generation and the generation before most of you folks. But I say this in all honesty. I do not know of a man who has a greater gift of evangelism than Dr. Curtis Hudson, who's the editor of The Sword of the Lord. Dr. John R. Rice edited that great paper which goes around the world and is published into the hundreds of thousands. I think the circulation is about 400 and something thousand, 450,000 at one time. Dr. John R. Rice, I believe, asked the Lord to lay upon his heart the one who was to succeed him. And I don't think anybody in the country hardly knew who it would be. But it was certainly God's man. Dr. Curtis Hudson is the editor of the Sword of the Lord. And I do not know of a man with a greater gift of evangelism and a man that knows more about how to get people to make a decision to trust the Lord and to be saved. Now, he's going to be speaking here on Sunday morning, the last Sunday of the month of May at the 11 o'clock service. And we're asking every department of our church, every phase, uh, the missionary circle of people, ladies fellowship, the Sunday school, the bus ministry, every department, the senior citizens uh, ministry, every department of this work of the Lord, we're asking you to go all out to have unsaved people here in this service on that Sunday morning. And I'm asking the Lord that he will uh, just hear our prayers and help us in this that we'll see scores of people saved on that Sunday morning, the last Sunday morning in May. Now, I want to see some saved next Sunday, some tonight, God willing. 
But we want to make that a great and special service. It isn't often that we have the privilege to hear a man of the caliber of Dr. Curtis Hudson, and he'll be here on that Sunday, God willing. We're looking forward to a wonderful time in the Lord, and we want to see a lot of people saved. Now, I want you to turn in your Bibles tonight. We've had quite a full evening and wonderful evening. I'm glad that Rick sang for us tonight when they ring those golden bells for you and me. And um, you may be wondering why he sang that particular song. A few days ago, I mentioned here, I'd like to hear that song sung along with another one. I'd like to hear somebody sing very soon. That great old song, Ira De Sankey, sang hundreds, maybe thousands of times in the Dwight L. Moody meetings. There were 90 and 9. I'd like to hear that sung sometime. Now, I'm not asking anybody to do it. I didn't ask Rick to do this. I'm just saying what I'd like to hear sometime. And then uh, I'd like sometime to hear someone sing uh, that great old song, his eyes on the sparrow. Don't you like that one? I do, and I'd like to hear, God willing, someone sing these for us. And when we get those done, I will have thought of some others by that time. I would like to hear. Now, I want you to look in the book of Luke at chapter 5 tonight. Luke chapter 5 and beginning with verse 36. Verse 36. And before we read the scripture tonight, and I want us to be very prayerful about what the Lord has to say to us tonight through His blessed Word. But before I read the Scripture, let me mention for the benefit of some of you who may be new or comparatively new, we're trying to speak from the parables of Jesus. For a number of weeks, we've spoken from the parables that Jesus spoke as a teacher. We're beginning tonight, and God willing, if the Lord gives us the privilege, we're going to be speaking from the parables Jesus spoke as an evangelist, as a soul winner. Then there are a number of parables following these that we'll be speaking, God willing, that Jesus spoke as a prophet. For he spoke some parables as a teacher, and he was the greatest teacher the world's ever known. And he spoke some parables as an evangelist, he was the greatest evangelist the world has ever known. And he spoke some parables as a prophet. We are now beginning, God willing, to bring you some of the parables of Jesus that he spoke as an evangelist, as a soul winner, to get people saved. And I'd like to say this to you tonight. We're only going to speak from the parables that the Bible calls a parable. We're not going to designate something is a parable that might be what is called by Bible students a similitude or other things uh, of the teaching of Jesus. We're going to use it as a parable if the Lord said it was a parable. I say that for a reason. You know, there are people that tell us that the story Jesus told of the rich man and the beggar that lay at his gate full of sores, the rich man died and the beggar died, and in hell the rich man lifted up his eyes, being in torment. There are people who say that's just a parable. It's to teach something. It's a parable. But it didn't actually happen. I want to disagree with that. The Bible doesn't say that it's a parable. And it uses proper names in it. it uses the name of Abraham. It uses the name of Lazarus. Parables are earthly illustrations of heavenly truth. And the Lord in His Word never used proper names in parables. You'll find that as you study the parables of Jesus. And I want us to look tonight in Luke chapter 5 and verse 36 to verse 39. And He spake also a parable unto them. No man putteth a piece of a new garment upon an old. If otherwise, then both the new maketh a rent or a tear, and the piece that was taken out of the new agreeeth not with the old. And no man putteth new wine 
into old bottles, else the new wine will burst the bottles and be spilled and the bottles will perish. But new wine must be put into new bottles and both are preserved. No man, having drunk old wine, straightway desireth new, for he saith, the old is better. And I'm not going to relate my message at all to that tonight. But some of these days, if the Lord lets me live, I want to preach a sermon on that last little expression, the old is better. But here is a two-part parable. One has to do with putting a piece of new cloth on an old garment. The other has to do with putting new wine, as the Bible says, into old bottles. Inasmuch as both of them are designed of the Lord to teach the same lesson, I want to concentrate tonight on the part of the parable where Jesus said, No man putteth a piece of a new garment on an old, if otherwise then both the new maketh a rent, and the piece that was taken out of the new agreeeth not with the old. And you might say tonight, we're speaking on the parable of the old garment and the new patch. Now, Jesus spoke many parables to get people saved, many of them. We call them, as I've already mentioned, the evangelistic parables. To give you an illustration, there is the parable of the rich fool. Differed altogether from what we mentioned a few moments ago, the rich man and Lazarus, both of whom died. There's the parable of the rich fool. And I preached from that parable a good many times. But you know, just in recent hours, it occurred to me that the Lord wanted that man to be saved. For the Lord said to him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Do you not believe tonight that the Lord said that to him? Because he wanted him to know, it's the last night you have on earth. And it would serve you well to get right with God before you enter into eternity. I think of the tremendous parable Jesus taught on the Good Samaritan, where he mentioned people who passed folks by, passed a man by who needed help, who had been robbed, beaten, left half dead, and um, people passed him by with unconcern. But then Jesus went on to relate how that a man came, and he called him a Good Samaritan, who came and ministered to the beaten and half-dead man. Every sinner is half-dead. This is a picture of a sinner. A sinner is alive physically, but he is dead spiritually. And the Lord is showing here, He loves that half-dead man, and He wants him to be holy and completely alive. I think of the great evangelistic parable Jesus told about the lost sheep. What a touching story. That man had a hundred sheep, Jesus said. Ninety and nine were safe in the fold. But there was one who was out on the mountains bleak. And the shepherd went out and sought till he found the lost sheep. And he brought him home. You see, that's to teach us. The shepherd is seeking for the lost tonight. In these parables, Jesus told these great evangelistic parables, and there are many of them, are designed to show us that the Lord Jesus Christ loves lost people. And all these parables are characterized by a love for lost people. Now I will say this to you tonight. Maybe it might help you in studying them. Most of these parables, the evangelistic parables, that are designed to show the love of Christ for lost souls are found in the Gospel of Luke. And there's a reason for that. Whereas Matthew sets forth our Lord as the King, and Mark sets Him forth as the servant, and John sets Him forth as the divine Son of God, the book of Luke sets Him forth as the Son of Man. And as the Son of Man, Jesus said, 
For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. Now there's a reason the Lord spoke the parable that I'm speaking to you about uh, tonight. The parable of an old garment and a new patch, which is unadvisable, the Lord said. The reason the Lord told that parable is not made clear here in the book of Luke. But it is made clear where the same parable is given in the book of Matthew. For there you find the Lord visiting people who were lost and without hope. They were hated people. He went into the homes of the publicans. He went into the for the suppers of the Pharisees because he loved them and he wanted them saved. People criticized the Lord. They said, well, look at the, this man that claims to be the Son of God. He eats with sinners and publicans and, un, and ungodly religious people. And then Jesus said these words, I am not come to call the righteous to repentance, but sinners. You see, the Lord is saying, I came to call the righteous to repentance. Then he goes ahead and gives the parable of the old garment with a new patch. Now there's some things that come to my mind as I look at this parable tonight. First of all, I must ask myself the question, why does the Bible use a garment as a symbol of something? And what does it symbolize? Now there's no question about the answer to that. I think the Bible is plain. The Lord uses a garment in the Bible, a garment. He uses as a symbol for one thing of man's self-righteousness. I could take you to many places in the Bible, but one verse, Isaiah chapter 64 and verse 6 says, All our righteousness is as filthy rags, and we are all as an unclean thing. He's saying that all the righteousness of man, I mean the best man can do, let him be baptized, let him join the church, let him turn over a new leaf, let him make a new start, let him resolve to be different. All of that, God says, is like a filthy, ragged garment. Man's righteousness is symbolized in the Bible as a filthy garment. Also in the Bible, there is no question whatsoever that a garment is used as a symbol of the righteousness of God. When you get out in the book of Revelation, the marriage supper of the Lamb has come. You read, and the wife made herself ready. That's the bride of Christ. And to her was given to be robed in fine linen, pure and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. So you see that in the Bible, a garment is used as a symbol of man's self-righteousness. And then God uses the right kind of a garment as a symbol of the righteousness of God. Now garment is to cover the nakedness of man. Uh, the Bible I illustrates this. I mean man's nakedness before God. It's a strange thing. When you find Adam and Eve in the garden uh, created by God himself, when you find Adam and Eve in the garden before the fall, there is no mention of them wearing clothes. But the Bible said when they sinned in Genesis 3, 7, they knew they were naked. They never knew it before then. Then when they sinned, they said, we're naked before God. And what did they do? They went out and the Bible said, sewed fig leaves together. They said, we must make a garment to hide our shame and cover our sin. But God did not accept it. Now Genesis chapter 3 says, And the Lord God came walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And verse 21 of Genesis chapter 3 says, And the Lord made them coats, garments of the skins of animals. And that presupposes the shedding of blood. And there is no garment 
of righteousness without the shedding of blood. Yes, the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. A garment is to cover man's nakedness. You know, garment is most necessary to protect from the heat and to protect from the cold. But a garment is looked upon as an instrument of acceptance amongst men. Now, I'm not, I'm not saying this. I'm not saying if one is dressed in cheap clothes that they're any less than one who's dressed in the most expensive clothes. I'm not saying that. But I am saying that the garments have something to do with people's acceptance. I say to you tonight, if someone were to come here who'd been wearing the same clothes, and I've met such people, I had the joy to win a man to the Lord years ago by the name of Arthur McVeigh, who wore the same clothes and slept in the same clothes for a periods of three months at a time, and people shunned him. And I can understand that. I had the joy to lead Arthur McVeigh and his sister to the Lord. I'm saying that people are acceptable in the right kind of a garment, namely a clean garment. And a person's garments have something to do with it being accepted by other people. And I want to say to you tonight, no one is accepted of God unless he's robed in the righteousness, the spotless righteousness of the blessed Son of God. No garment pleases the Holy Father except that imputed unto us when we're saved, the righteousness of Christ. Now notice the Lord said, an old garment. He said, no man putteth a new patch, a new piece of cloth to an old garment. Why did the Lord call this garment that symbolizes man's self-righteousness an old garment? Well, it's because it is old. It's as old as Adam and Eve, who in their self-righteousness made their garments of fig leaves, which God repudiated, and God refused to accept. They raised a son who one day, when he would pretend to come to God, came with an offering from the ground. That which this earth produces, fruits and flowers and vegetables, but bloodless. God said, I'll have no part of it. But they also had a son by the name of Abel, who learned that God is never pleased except with a garment provided by blood. And when Abel came, he did not bring the fruit of this earth. This earth produces nothing good as far as righteousness in the eyes of God is concerned. But when Abel came, he came with the firstling of the flock. And he offered a lamb upon the altar of sacrifice and shed its blood. Why did the Lord say an old garment? Because it's as old as Adam and Eve and as old as Cain. He said an old garment because all that man can do to be saved in the eyes of God is worn and rotten and ragged and defiled and filthy and stinking. And the Lord says all that man can do is like a filthy garment. That's why the Bible says all our righteousnesses, plural, are as filthy rags, our garments, and we are all as an unclean thing. The Lord said an old garment, because it's worn and rotten, defiled and filthy, and stinking in the nostrils of God, man's self-righteousness. He said an old garment, I think because it presupposes there once was a new garment. And I think that maybe the reference is to when the Lord created Adam and Eve, He established them in a state of innocence. They lost that innocence when they, when they sinned and when they fell. They lost that innocence and sought to regain it by a garment of their own making, which was refused to the Lord. So when the Lord says an old garment, I think it, it presupposes there was one time when man was beautifully clothed before God 
in a garment of innocence until Satan came and man fell. I think he said, old garment. Because man that is unsaved is like a garment that has reached the condition where it cannot be mended. You don't need to patch the old human nature. It's not putting a patch on the old garment. But bless God, it's putting on a new garment provided by the Lord. You see, it's a beautiful picture of that when the prodigal came home and when he reached his father's house, the Lord put shoes on his feet. That's to serve him. The, how beautiful are the feet of those upon the mountains who preach the gospel of good tidings. He put a ring upon his finger that is for the perpetuity of this relationship. It's forever. It's forever. It will never end. And the ring on his finger says, You're mine forever. And then he put a robe upon his back and robed him. No longer is he a ragged prodigal in the pen of hogs, but he's robed in a garment provided by his own father and sits at the father's table. No, no use trying to mend the, the old garment. A lot of folks are doing that. You know, there are a lot of, I think, good organizations in a way. I know folks tonight who are depending on the fact they've been to the AA, the Alcoholics Anonymous. They've gotten victory over drink. I'm all right now, they say. No, you're not. No, you're not. There'll be a many a person in hell never touched a drop of liquor in their life. You won't go to heaven because you don't drink. You'll only go to heaven because you've been made a new creature in Christ Jesus. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away, and behold, all things have become new. Now then, Jesus said, you don't put a new patch, a new piece of cloth on an old garment, because the old garment's so shaky, it's so rotten, it is so much at the end of itself, that the new will just tear from the old, and the condition will be even worse. So you don't do that, he says. Now I think the Lord is teaching in this parable three or four tremendous lessons. First of all, I'm sure the Lord is teaching that grace and works cannot be mixed. My friend, if you could know tonight how many millions of people there are in this United States of America who are depending on their works to get them to heaven, you'd be shocked. You and I know that's not true. You and I know that no man is saved by his works. For by grace are you saved. Grace is unmerited favor, undeserved kindness. Grace is the love and mercy of God extended. Oh, don't depend on being baptized to get you to heaven. You ought to be baptized. Bible teaches it and teaches how and when. Don't depend on sitting at the Lord's table to get you to heaven. You ought to sit there and every Christian ought to remember the body and blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't depend on the fact that there's a card over here somewhere in a file has your name and your address and a date on it. Don't depend on that. The only thing a man can depend on is the grace of God. And being saved because he came to the Lord as a sinner and trusted in Jesus Christ. I think the Lord's teaching us that God's righteousness and man's righteousness cannot be mixed together. You know, you're not saved by a combination of your good works and your righteousness and you doing right and the Lord's righteousness. There is no such thing as a combination of two. Romans 10.4 is a, good, a great verse. I wish everybody would underscore it in your Bible. Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. He's the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. He, he is teaching... You don't mix the righteousness of man and the righteousness of God. I've talked about, I've talked to people about being saved in my lifetime, and I've had people say to me, well, you know, I'm not good enough. That always thrills me. I, I'd much rather hear a person say, I'm not good enough, than to hear a person say, I'm good enough as I am. I don't need to be saved. But I've heard people say, I'm waiting until I'm good enough. 
that moment will never come. Never come. Never come. You could spend your days from this Sunday night till the day you left this earth bettering yourself and you'll never, never be good enough to be saved. Because God does not mix the righteousness of man and the righteousness of God. We're saved through the righteousness of God. Now listen, you know when I thought of this, uh, don't put a new patch on an old filthy ragged garment. I thought about how the Lord's children are dressed up. And you know in the eyes of God tonight, you see, He's the King. He's the Heavenly Father. And He's judged or evaluated, so to speak, by the way He dresses His children. I think that's what the psalmist had in mind when he said the king's daughter is all glorious within. Now think of that. Think of it. The king's daughter is all glorious within. You see, it's got to be in here. But notice what that verse says. Psalm 45, verse 13. The king's daughter is all glorious within. Her clothing is of wrought gold. You see, the king wants his children to look well. And God, the Father tonight, wants the children of God to look good to him. So he clothes them in the righteousness of the Son of God. The king's children wear a new garment. The garment of God's righteousness has no flaw, no spot, and no blemish. There's no spot on it needs cleaning. There's no wrinkle in it needs ironing. There's no blemish in it that would cause it to be have to be remade. You know, the, the ultimate of it is explained in Ephesians uh, chapter four, 5 and verse 27, where we read that he might present it to himself a glorious church. Now look, listen. Here's what God says, the way God says it's going to be when you stand before the Lord. Present it to himself a glorious church not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that it should be holy and without blemish. You see, when you're dressed up in the garment of God's righteousness, God looks upon you and me as if you'd never sin. And He sees us in Christ. And He sees only the righteousness of His own dear Son. This, this, the garments remind me of something. Garments, there are some to be put off. And there are some to be put on. And that's what the Bible says. Lie not one to another, seeing you've put off the old man with his deeds, and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge, after the image of him that created him. Colossians 3, 9 and 10. So what the Lord is saying, don't try to, Fix up the old garment. It's impossible. Just get the new one, which is the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. Shall we pray? Our Father in heaven, we want to thank you tonight for the wonderful care you've taken of us as your children. Thank you for your provision of your Son, the perfect one, to die for sinners such as we. And Lord, I want to thank you tonight that when you look upon us as your children, you see us robed in a garment without spot or wrinkle or blemish.